Here we go. So just for Marco, uh, let's see where the uh, notes link is, the right one. Yeah, Sean posted that the, the correct the notes link. Oh, he did. Oh, okay, I missed that. Okay, great. Uh, and so, Marco, if you if you if you go to the incorrect notes link, you actually might find something, some text I'm that will help right you get started. Is, I'm on the right one. It's just really empty. So I I will also try to fill it in with with some old ones. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you can just fill it in with the agenda. I yes, that really, that yeah. one is on me. I apologize because. I had teaching all day today, so it was a bit, yeah, back. Let me see. Okay, so that's uh, it's five, six past now, so let's go ahead. Um, so welcome to the Lake Interim Meeting for December, I guess. Uh, so we have some slides, chair slides being presented. I'm one of your chairs. Uh, Manisha is the second one. I don't know if you want to say hello and send video, Manisha, or perhaps you're doing it already. I can't see. Um, in the meantime, we have kind of boring chair slides. There's one issue there. Uh, we have the Note Wales, an ITF working group. You should probably have seen this before looking at the participant list. I think everybody has. Uh, we have a note taker. If you could make sure that your name is mentioned in the notes and the link to the notes was just sent in the chat, then that would be great just for the purposes of collecting blue sheets. Um, that's not well. Agenda, we're at the administrative part now. Um, Militia will give us a bit of an update. I don't think there's any slides for that um, on the no, it's, no, it's straightforward, really. Great. Yeah. Uh, then Yoran, I think, is going to be doing the presenting today from uh, on behalf of himself and John. And next steps on any other business. Uh, I guess one thing I we, we had thought about using uh, Meet Echo Come, is. Does that, if anybody has used Meet Echo for interim meetings and has opinions, then letting the chairs know those opinions will be good. Um, otherwise, I think we might want to try it next time. Is that what you think, Militia? Uh, yes, that's what I was thinking. As long as it has all the features uh, that we have, but I guess yeah, it does the recording. It should be fine. So I would be happy to try it out next time. Okay, so so yeah, if, if everybody hates that idea, let us know. If otherwise, we'll probably try Meet Echo for the next time we have an interim. Uh, otherwise, any agenda bashing? And I'm I'm keeping an eye on the Jabber uh, room as it happens. Uh, okay, no agenda bash in that case, uh, Militia, Over to you. All right, thank you, Stephen. So, uh, on the just a quick update on the call for a formal analysis, we uh, declared at the twelve version of ad hoc as ready for formal analysis uh, a couple uh, couple of weeks ago, just after ITF one twelve. Uh, Kartik uh, volunteered to help us by forwarding the email that I sent to the Lake Working Group uh, list, mailing list, to the different teams involved uh, and interested in doing formal analysis. So now what is interesting, we already have some feedback. We have one team uh, between France and Germany that is uh, that will be looking into symbolic analysis. Uh, essentially, they will uh, try to extend the model that was done in that reference uh, from Carl Norman's paper. So using Tamarin and Proverif, uh, essentially verifying those properties and making a more in-depth model. So that's on the symbolic side. Uh, on the crypto side, we have uh, two teams that have stepped up. Uh, Kartik is in contact with them. Uh, we will be uh, hopefully getting more information about this during the next ITF meeting, 130. So yes, that would be it on my side. Do we have any questions? Uh, another question, but just to encourage people, I guess um, Militia and, <coughs> and, and, and folks have done a nice job on preparing a document to help people do that analysis. I, don't, I didn't see many comments on the list. I don't know if you got many off list on that, Militia, but uh, if on not, I'd encourage people to read it and comment. 
Uh, yeah, yes, indeed, indeed. So, yeah, uh, I would uh, like to go ahead and publish that paper somewhere in some venue. Uh, so, I will, uh, if any comments are, uh, if people have any comments, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I think it's a useful document. So, thanks for doing that. Okay, any any other questions about analysis or what, trying to find that? No? Don't see anything in Jabber. So, okay, um, on we go. And I guess I'll stop presenting and uh, you can do your own sharing, guys. Um, do you have slides? Would be great. Do you want me to present them? Yes, please. Okay, one second. Okay, so while they are loading here, I'm, I'm Joran Selander and I'm going to talk about the two drafts. We are working on the ad hoc and the traces draft. Next slide, please. So um, there are essentially no changes to the draft. Um, ad hoc is still in version 12. Uh, so all the work is being done on the, on the master branch and issues and PRs. And the traces draft is no changes either, except for the name. So now it's adopted. So we'll go through the open GitHub issues, which contain uh, issues on the reviews, the traces, and, and the other, which is essentially the ad hoc. Next slide, please. So we have had a, a fifth review uh, today by Sean. Sean, thank you very much for that. Uh, we put it as number issue number 217. There is no PR yet, but there are a few comments which um, we'll bring up in a later slide. So there are already three of them uh, are completed. We have agreed with the uh, people making the review that we have taken the comments into account, closed and merged. And Stephen only got yesterday uh, the last, the uh, update to the PR 211 there. So, uh, it's no hurry. Let me know, let us know when you have had the time to look at it. And as a result of these reviews, there were additional issues, which we'll come to now. Next slide. And, uh, yeah, these are the new, new issues since, uh, ITF 112. And I'll briefly go through them. And then we have some other slides on the old issues and updates to those. And then there's some more. So, but this is um, number 215 is a, uh, starting from a comment by Marco. And uh, it's essentially uh, just stating that we should make sure that you could apply the same type of processing independently of if you use an X509 certificate or a CPR web token. So that's that's the ambition, and uh, we should just make sure that that's the, also the case. The three following issues uh, came out of Stevens' review. Uh, one was on, well, two are on security considerations um, due to leaking information from public random material or or tracking based on connection IDs. So those are good comments. We need to address them with appropriate security considerations. And issue 212 uh, is about one of the sections we've struggled with, the authentication parameters, which um, since um, since we're looking at both um, X509 and CWT and so on, this is, we need to have this, uh, we needed some space to expand on that, but we still can, I think, can shorten this section make it more concise without taking away the examples. So that's that issue. And we haven't done any of those yet. Um, then number 210 is was also, well, that, that was basically multiple comments regarding the external authorization data. And we decided we should make an appendix explaining more details about that because that seemed to be a little bit confusing. And there's a separate slide following this one, I think. 
Um, and then there is number 209, which is a proposal from Stefan Ristosov to change the mandate to, to implement Cypher Suite to what's stated here. And I'll, there's a separate slide on that. Number 208 uh, is about the statement in the uh, processing where we say that if you send an error message, then you should discontinue processing. That was something both Marco and Sean reacted on. And we think this is needed uh, because errors may be sent for various reasons, but as soon as you send an error, that should at least be uh, a necessary condition for discontinuing. Uh, sorry, sufficient condition for, for discontinuing. Um, and we propose to add some text about left to the implementer. There is also more. Uh, maybe we can back can come back to that in when, uh, in Sean's comment later. Uh, then we have number two hundred and four, and that's basically the understanding of um, the length of the labels that determines whether you need one or extra uh, one or multiple iterations of the hash function in the KDF. And it turns out that the actual labels we had chosen were slightly too long to uh, so would 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 add un unnecessarily one hash uh, operation. So therefore we propose to shorten the ma OSCORE master secret and OSCORE master salt by removing the term master, uh, which might be contentious for other reasons. So everyone is happy, I, I suppose. Um, so that we already have a PR for, and let us know if you're not, not happy with that proposal. That's just a label. Those were the new issues. Any any comments on those? Maybe short. 213, we plan to do more than security considerations, but not in Lake. Core have already started working on uh, <clears throat> negotiation of uh, new connection IDs in OSCORE. Um, in the kudos draft, which is great. Yeah, great, great, John. Good, good point. So there is actually, uh, as we explained in the response to that comment, there is actually this draft which already looks at alternatives for for preventing tracking by by means of changing connection identifiers. So that's a good comment. Uh, okay, unless there are any other comments. Here we move on to the next slide. So this was, yeah, this one was the one from Stefan. Um, so as we've said already, uh, discussed a number of times and in relation to this issue number 22, um, existing devices can not always be expected to support both BCDSA and ADDSA. So, we only previously we only required either uh, either of these, and that's I mean that's that's actually also the requirement here. But uh, the proposal here is that we actually make it slightly more uh, useful uh, by requiring if you implement uh, one of the ECDSA uh, cipher suites, then there is another one which only differ in the size of MAC length, and the same for EDDSA. So, so that would be Cypher Suite 0 and 1 only differ in, in MAC length and Cypher Suites 2 and 3 analogously. So therefore it makes sense to require both um, 1 and 0 and both uh, 2 and 3 together. And obviously if, if there is a less constrained device, you should be able to implement both ECDSA and EDDSA and therefore support all four Cypher Suites. Uh, I don't know if I made it more complicated in my explanation here. I, perhaps it's simpler just to read the text. So do we have any questions or comments on this? Uh, I hear none, so maybe a couple on my side. Uh, so here you say, uh, essentially what I read is that we are now recommending we are having should for four cipher suites that is correct right for less constrained devices 
so one issue I have with this text is that less constrained devices is not really defined. Uh, we are following the uh, terminology in RFC, in Carson's RFC, I forget which one, with the precise definition of classes. So that would be the first point. Second, uh, the keyword endpoints here uh, seems very, very confusing. Uh, why do we use the term endpoint and not device? That would be my second point for should. And then third, I guess this is a lot this is a logical or right yes yes so what does this mean what does the or mean yeah yes what does or mean in this context so we have zero and one right or logical or two and three so I'm right just i mean trying to make sense uh, out yeah, okay. of the proposal so uh, so what would it translate to in practice right yeah so so in, in practice maybe the, the the title is better than the actual uh, spec text, proposed spec text here. That either um, so some devices support ECDSA and those implement uh, two and three. Other devices support only EDDSA, and those implement zero and one. And you should implement either. But that's not what this text says, right? Okay. I mean, if you have, so if we dissect like zero and what you have in the title, right? If yep. you do the logical table of truths, I mean, uh, when device implements zero and one, two and three, uh, device implements uh, two and three. So if you do the logical table, you will end up uh, in any case that what you will have to implement is zero and one. And the only case where you won't be implementing uh, zero in one is where either of them is not implemented. Neither of them is implemented. Am I missing something? Um, or maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> I, I, I thought that was, I mean, we, we need to ex be able to explain uh, that when yeah. you implement the DSA, there are two cipher suites implement and when you implement EDDSA, there are two, two. No, but I'm just looking at this in terms of hardware because we have a clear split between NIST uh, P256, which is Cypher Suite 2 and 3 on the right hand, on the right side here. And then we have the uh, the devices implementing the AdWords curve. So zero and one. So what this proposal is saying is that essentially we should in all cases be going with the adverts curve what no i i don't really understand how you can make that i mean if, if no. you make a truth table out of the the parentheses at the top here the title yes so let's do that <laughs> then i would expect that if you do if you do zero only zero then you will get false if you do zero and one you get true because yes. zero and one, if, if you do both zero and one, then zero and one is true. And then whatever comes after or doesn't matter. And the same if you do two and three, if you do either uh, only two, that's not good enough. If you do two and three, then you get true in the parentheses to the right. And then you have or, so it doesn't matter what's on the left. What, what's the uh, but problem? So just the question is like in terms of interoperability. Yeah. Uh, like when are we gonna have interoperability in this case? So if 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 a device, I mean, obviously, a device that implements ECDSA, uh, if one does that and the other implements EDDSA, that will not lead to interoperability. That that so is that is the, the right. at least so not between each other. Right? Now now it seems like we are on the other issue that we have decided to have a formal vote of later. John is referring but to I issue twenty two. Uh, yeah, no, no. So, I mean, I just wanted to wrap up maybe this, uh, this slide, because I mean, when we're talking about the true table, right? I, uh, the only case where the devices will interoperate is where both of them implement both. Right. I mean, so a, a typical right. case is that you have one, one constrained device and one unconstrained device, and, and those will interoperate because the unconstrained device would, or the less constrained device would support all four. So, so the case, which we are not 
covering, which is not being going to interrupt, is if we have a device which only implements ECDSA, talking to another device only implementing EDDSA. But okay. that's that, that was basically that's what's the content of of issue twenty two, where we say that we accept that we accept those issues because uh, the alternative is that some some devices will not be able to work with ad hoc because they only implement one of the uh, cipher suites. But that's or one of the. Yeah, so this is really related, like to what Stephen was saying. How do we see this protocol, whether as a as an MVP kind of protocol, minimal viable product that is going to be lightweight to implement on many devices, and that is going to interoperate in most cases, or as a very generic framework that can be extended and that can su support uh, many many things, which of course uh, diverges from interoperability. So, yeah, I mean, maybe, I don't know if now is the good time to open the discussion. Does anyone either have opinions on this? I just want to explain uh, probably what was my motivation when I commented this. So, from my perspective, it, so if the device supports suit zero and one, uh, suit zero, so it is no, not, no, there is no additional functionality needed so there are all all um, implementations are in place as well to support uh, suit one so if you support zero suit zero then there is no problem to support suit one and the same is as well true for suit two and suit three yes indeed but uh we should have uh a gluing layer, I would say, which would enable interoperability between different kinds of devices. So I really believe we should have uh, one cipher suite that is mandatory to implement. And then obviously we can add for different devices, we can add the other other cipher suites. Mm. But well, I, I think I think that's this is actually issue 22 you're speaking of. And what if I remember the the, the consensus on that was that we should we should return to that when after working group last call or at working group last call and then have a vote or sort of come to an agreement because we discussed that for quite some time and we didn't really agree on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if you remember, I, I see your point. Yes, yes, I see your point. Point. But my my issue here is that uh, it will depend, right? Uh, we are now in the process where people are formally formally analyzing. The spec, this includes a very important part of that process is the computational analysis, which algorithms play a crucial role. So I think it would really, it, it would be important to have something streamlined with, that we could point people to. And uh, of course, people are, will be implementing these in the next six months. So what gets implemented, we don't get to, uh, to get at the point where uh, we do not, we, where we do not want to change or make any other decisions, because there are already some implementations that that uh, supports one or the other. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, but but I think what you are saying is that we should take the decision of issue twenty two at the next interim meeting, uh, because I don't think we will conclude today. Uh, uh, yes, and the, diff the difference, option, yes. And the difference between option, but, mm -hmm. the difference between what's stated here and what's in version twelve is this uh, this zero. I mean, if you take away zero and one and replace that with um, with zero, then th you get basically what uh, and two and three and replace that with three. Then you get what's what's in the current text. So it's it's. Uh, we can revert to that if you think that's a, a better option, and uh, that's a discussion yeah, we no, should I have. Mean, we are kind of post yeah, I mean, but this I, is pretty close to what we have already. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So no, I'm ju I'm just uh, I mean we ha we raised that point several times. So I would really uh, we should open a discussion at some point. If you do not want to open the discussion today, that is fine. But and next interim is is okay. Uh, but we should just uh, note that, I mean, we really, I mean, we are talking about constrained devices, right? And we have very precise metrics uh, on what that we want to optimize for. These metrics are performance, code size, uh, performance, code size, and uh, message overhead uh, on, uh, on, the, on the performance side. Then there is obviously security. 
So uh, these are very clear indicators and how we should measure this decision that we take. So mm. that's that's my stand on this. So I think uh, you're I'm... sorry for interrupting, Malisha. Go ahead. No, no, that's that's fine. I mean, I don't want to abuse my uh, role as a chair. So I would really like to hear other people's opinion on this. So yes. we have some comments in the in the ch in the chat. Uh, if anybody who's commenting in the chat wants to grab the microphone, this is probably a good time. Yeah. So I think the the. A uh, decision to say uh, if somebody does uh, Edwards, uh, he does both versions, and if somebody does uh, NIST, uh, she does both versions. That's a good decision, and I understood that this is the decision here in number 209. And I think this should be pretty uncontroversial. Uh, the other decision, whether we um, can make a single mandatory to implement group out of these two and decide for Edwards or decide for uh, NIST. Uh, that's an interesting uh, question, but it's kind of orthogonal to what we are discussing on this slide here. So my, my um, point on the other question uh, would be um, on, on the actually constrained devices, uh, people will use whatever they have uh, hardware support for. Uh, so we we will uh, factually have two fragments here, one that, that has hardware support uh, for um, NIST and one that has hardware support for Edwards. And these fractions will never interoperate and, and we, we can, uh, stand in the corner and shout has, as much as we want, but th that's just not realistic. Uh, so I don't think we should write something into the, the standard that is not uh, realistic. Uh, another question might be, do we have a preference? And I think that's a rather interesting question and I'd rather discuss that uh, instead of uh, saying uh, uh, one uh, is mandatory to implement and one is not because that's simply not realistic. Yeah, thank, thank you, so, Carson. Yeah. Uh, I, have a pro I have a proposal um, yes, on, on, on the order of, of things here that we, we come back to this question. I mean, this is, if we agree that this is somehow two separate issues, one, 209 and 22, I propose that we don't. Sure, uh, sorry, Yaron, just to make sure that I yep. uh, understand this. So uh, what you're proposing on this slide is that if device implements uh, Cypher Suite 0, it must also Im implement Cypher Suite 1, or the other case, implements if it implements 2, it also has to support 3. Correct. Okay. What, uh, not what, what it says. What is the benefit? What is the added That's benefit? That's not what it says. So, so folks, we're probably um, rat holding a little bit on this, um, and yeah. it's yeah. absolutely for sure that the working group will revisit this topic because people always revisit this topic multiple times. So, unless there's something really pressing on this, I suggest, in the interest of time, we kind of move along. And if we've time left over at the end, yeah. we can come back to it. And uh... yeah, thanks, Stephen. No, no, that absolutely makes sense. So maybe, yeah, yeah, I jumped, uh, jumped ahead. So I don't think the issue is pressing, but it's kind of dependent on the progress of the formal analysis. So I guess we do want to, uh, to decide on this soon. So, so, so Malisha, I, I just want to make the point that we kind of don't get to decide really here. Implementers decide, and we know from history that they will do what they want and what they want will depend on on what tools they have and the tools they have will basically push them towards NIST or or not. And so it's, it's not really under our control, I don't think. But we can take yeah, an action so to try and bring this up as a topic on the list um, just after the holidays. So as, as a chair is kind of action, we can start that discussion. So there is a comment by Yuri. Um, my point is vendors that want to claim conformance to an, to an RFC usually implement the necessary minimum and either omit or charge more for optional stuff. I would rather avoid 256-bit cipher suites being in that category. So I guess this goes more along the lines of having an MVP kind of uh, solution, right? 
it's at least how I read it, but uh, it's, we can we can discuss. Yeah. So but, yeah. yeah. To, these are, these are the max. So the max is either eight or, or sixteen bytes. Uh, in this case, so it's not a, about two hundred fifty six bit cipher suites being mandatory. Just a clarification on that, if that was oh, clear. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, the only difference yeah, yeah. between the, the two, with zero and one, is the, the Mac is either eight bytes or 16 bytes. The same goes for Cypher Suite 2 and 3. Yeah, so this is the same. It's, I mean, it's the question of, we have a GitHub issue where we don't have much input uh, related to this. But yeah, I propose we move on for today, and then we revisit this in January uh, during the next interim. Uh, it is important that we converge on this and that we have the best possible uh, text in the in the document that enables uh, the existing hardware as well as future uh, devices to interoperate really. And I guess for that, what would be really important is to have like a clear list uh, of what Karsten uh, mentioned of hardware devices supporting one or the other. Uh, because what I've seen more, more what I've seen was more on the side of the P two fifty six curve being implemented in hardware, which all, all may, all, already gives uh, an edge in terms of uh, performance. Uh, but maybe I'm missing some uh, devices that support uh, the hardware implementation of X two five five nine, and or I'm not aware of them. So it, this will be a really important uh, input for the working group to decide. Yeah, so could, if I could just add to that, I think more discussion on the on the on the mailing list or in the GitHub issue or in both of these, if we want to have, if people disagree with this setting as well, and then I think we need to have a meeting where we decide, we, because this has been an, an a sort of an extent, extended uh, discussion where we, we I, I, the reason why I didn't want to pro progress it now is that we there is no chance we can reach an agreement today, so that's why it's somehow pointless to continue. I think. Okay, so Stephen is proposing to revisit this on the list. Doesn't need a meeting. So I tend I to, so. yeah, so. Hi, Stephen. Did I? So, yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's a good idea. So maybe as a plan A, we should try to discuss this on the list and have a conclusion to wrap on that. Uh, but before the next interim, if we don't, then we uh, we also bring it up during the next interim, which I hope to have uh, in mid-January. Does that work for everyone? Sounds good. All right. Uh, can we please note this in the action points? Uh, uh, I guess Marco is taking care of that. Okay. So next issue, and this was the EAD use cases uh, and to understand the EAD processing better, we propose to make an appendix where we pre present some of the use cases and also show how those fit into the processing steps. And if they don't, then we need to change the processing steps. So that's, that could be an exercise as well. Uh, this was based on, on uh, Stephen's comment about, about the order of the processing steps. So here are uh, four examples, which uh, at least three of them has been thought through, I think, but the fourth maybe uh, came up as part of the review. Uh, so the first example is using the uh, EAD1 and EAD2 for as a request response for a third party uh, assertion. So it's essentially uh, the, the device is encrypting the identity for a third party and uh, the uh, the responder being a controller or, or coordinator or, or, or an authenticator is passing on uh, this encrypted uh, identity and gets back a voucher uh, which it forwards in the EAD2 and that is then uh, like an uh, assertion with which the device can decide that this is an authorized party to which I should connect and thereby continue the protocol. So that's one example, which there is a, an ACE draft describing more in detail. A uh, second example is to do with remote attestation. So it's the case when uh, the authenticator 
can provide a request for an entity attestation token in uh, EAD2, and it gets back the ETH in EAD3. With so it could sort of at the same time as authenticating the uh, the device and and establishing the identity of the device, it could also verify the uh, firmware version and and secure boot uh, has taken place and such things. So that's another example. Third example is the enrollment uh, setting. So many uh, onboarding situations start with an authenticating protocol and then uh, uh, follows uh, an enrollment procedure where the device is issued a certificate for a particular domain. And in this case, the, the certificate signing request is passed in EAD3 and uh, so then the, the responder can uh, authenticate and, and authorize the device to be a, uh, a legitimate member of this domain and issue a certificate to pass it back in EAD4. Uh, and the fourth example here is with OCP, OCSP stapling, uh, which is not really uh, described in detail, but it's an uh, sort of an, an idea that it should probably work in the same way, where you uh, basically provide with your certificate, you provide a OCSP response or just, yeah, what, whatever is, is um, this is the type of freshness and verification uh, uh, assertion uh, that provides sufficient information to decide that this is a non-revoked certificate. And that could happen on both sides. Potentially, so that's that's basically the, the type of use cases that is uh, intended for 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 EAD. And if you notice here, that most of these the, the relevant information in most of these cases is already protected outside ad hoc by a, a, a th with a sort of in, there is an association with a third party somehow, a CA or or a trusted third party. So uh, for so that, we have a question from Sean. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Well, I was just going to wait to the end because Gorn, I was just going to say that uh, I had at least two comments about EAD related things that you're talking about right now with respect to the CSR and the right. OCP response. So getting rid of these will knock those off. So that, that's exactly what I was looking for. So thanks. Um, right. Okay. So um, was there anything clearer here or did you want to add something? No, I mean, I think if you just continue the explanation, if you have, okay. a, for example, <laughs> Go ahead. you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna answer my comment more fully than I ever thought you were going to. So Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try that. Okay. Yeah, I, I have, I'll come back, come back to your comments, actually. Um, not all of them, though, but in a later slide. So, yeah, so, so I mean, you're, you asked specifically about the CSR, um, whether you would, um, you would be able to get the certificate without an initial certificate uh, sort of if you what, what are you basing authentication on in the first place and 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 in this case i mean the a common setting is that you actually have some credential some initial credential like a manufacturer certificate and that you use to bootstrap and uh, to authenticate and and then to uh, you may you may be able to use the same uh, public private key pair potentially and and then use that in the certificate signing request uh, so, and that's also why this or this CSR is orange here. This could actually be, since you're already signing message three, you could potentially not sign the CSR because that would be basically double signature using the same uh, uh, public key. But it, it depends on what are the endpoints, and that's that's a lot of security considerations in in relation to. It. So I, I don't want to go into the details, but. Uh, it, it's but it's it's possible for for certain cases that the CSR is not uh, signed, uh, and that that but then that 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 has an implication on the process. But in general, what I wanted to say is that the, the processing steps are, uh, as you see below here, that uh, you uh, you pass the EAD to the security application, uh, then you verify the allowed identity, and then you verify the signature or MAC. And, and Stephen's question was basically, can you really pass the AD to the security application before you have verified the, uh, that the identity is allowed and, and the signature or MAC? And just passing it to the security application doesn't, first of all, uh, in, in most cases, as we see here, it's you could verify the EAD by other means, not necessarily using ad hoc. And secondly, just because you pass it to the security application doesn't 
necessarily mean that you act upon upon it at that step. You could still wait for uh, verification of identity and signature or MAC. But the reason why this is the step is actually where it is is that you might need that information to verify the allowed identity. So, for example, in the first case with the voucher, the purpose of the voucher is to gain information about the trusted uh, given by the trusted third party of, of that the authenticator is an authorized party. So, so you need that information already uh, in this in the step after. So, if you pass the EAD too too late to the security application, then you won't be able to do this. I don't know if that answered uh, the question, but that's what we're going to write in this appendix, I suppose. Stephen, does it make sense to you? Yeah, sure, it makes sense. Uh, I mean, I guess the the issue is that this is fertile ground for people to introduce vulnerabilities by having different expectations between the ad hoc yeah. implementation, the EAD provider, and the consumers, and so on. So, as long as we document the security considerations well enough, I think we cover the basics. But uh, it, it's a tricky area, and it's a uh, it's ripe for for messing up. Acknowledged. Okay, then we move on to the next. Uh, so okay, so now we're done with the old with the new issues, and and we we now have the old issues which have been updated. Um, so there is one uh, two one dealing with cryptographic, minor cryptographic stuff, uh, and then uh, we filled into that multiple comments from Stephen's review. Uh, so for example, we should should mention. Uh, the possibility of collision of ephemeral keys already in processing of message one. We should have security considerations about using 64 and 128 bit max, at least extend on those. And there's also some mandatory to implement cipher suite considerations, uh, which was which is essentially the discussion we had uh, uh, previously today in this meeting. And, and we should, of course, summarize the conclusions of, of the later discussion as well so that's an update to that issue uh, 198 is an issue on uh, which we already talked about in itf 112 yes that's the right slide thank you uh, and no that's the wrong slide so we're still on uh, on the this one yes thank you uh, so here we have uh, uh, we have a pr which is merged. The news is there is a PR. Uh, have a look at that. Um, issue 193 was a discussion at the ITF 112, and the proposal is to not change it, just close the issue. Uh, number 191. I'm stressing a little bit. I'm noting the time is, is going here. So uh, stop me if there is something you want to do in detail. Uh, 191. Uh, this is just something we've done uh, in the master branch. And, but 100, 189, I'd like to stop at. So that was the question about the uh, padding to hide the length of ID cred I and ID cred R. And uh, there Marco had a comment. Um, so what we state in the PR 190 is that it's optional to support this padding. And uh, Marco's comment was that uh, you should always be be able to to receive. I mean, if if it, if this is included, this padding is included, it should be mandatory to be able to take away the padding, but you don't have to send do the padding. That that was basically the, I think that the proposal by Marco. Did I get it right, Marco? Yeah, I just suggested to say optional to use, um, but it sounded like something to be supported just in case you, you want to use it for that particular message. I think I left a comment in line in the PR. Yeah. Long ago. That's right. Sounded so, simpler to put it that way, like optional to use. Uh, optional, yeah, that's... Um... For the sender. Um, exactly, optional to use for the sender. That's what we said. Optional, to, okay. Meaning that it, it has to be supported like many other things. As right. As the protocol. Yeah. So mandatory to support for the receiver and optional to use for the sender. That's your. Yeah. Stake. Okay. That that sounds good to me. Any other comments on this? Okay. Next one. 
Next slide, please. Um, right. So then we had the uh, EAD in, in internal structure. Um, I don't think that's much to discuss. It's basically a proposal for a format. Uh, and the other, it's not so much, I just want to point out that we have some other issues which we haven't closed. And uh, for some of them, we are waiting for input, uh, like uh, 178, we'd like to add a use case here, uh, number 167. We reopened, uh, that's next slide. That's because of Kathleen's review. 139, uh, we haven't got any reaction on that. We'd like to close that one. Uh, number 84, we'd like to close as well. Uh, number 81, uh, we think we're done. We'd like to just want to have a confirmation from the creator of the issue. Uh, number 50, we think it's not so critical in this draft. It can be registered later. And finally, number 22, which we won't talk more about today. Uh, so basically what we had as an, uh, any, an, an, uh, a request from, from ITF 112 was that we should make a list of the issues we like to close and send us an email to the mailing list and say, we are going to close these. Do you have any objection? Otherwise we just do it. And many of the issues in this slide are of that type. So unless there are any, any input on any of those, we'll go to the next slide. And you're already on the next slide. Thank you. So um, Kathleen uh, commented, uh, maybe there should be some specification required for some of the IANA considerations, uh, something we discussed at an interim. And we actually think, thought it, it wasn't necessary, but when she, she made a comment, we, we had a careful look and we realized that at least for the ad hoc method type registry, if someone wants to define a new ad, ad hoc method, then surely you would like to have a specification for that one. Um, so that was an oversight from our side and uh, therefore we reopened 167 and if people have any other input here that would be great to hear either now or later. Okay, the issue is reopened, you can uh, make a comment later if you like. So next slide please. Right, so now we go to the traces stock draft temporarily and going back to the adult later. So this is the uh, the proposal for traces. We had an action point from ITF 112 to come back with a proposal, which of the methods and cipher suites and credentials should we include in the very detailed traces draft? This is not talking about all the uh, test vectors that are in, in the GitHub. It's just those specifically uh, specific traces which shows all the middle steps and, and all the uh, with also annotated with nice nice uh, English text and so on and there was um, so previously we had two uh, the, bl the black ones uh, on the uh, on the left and now we have thought that may maybe we should have one for each method so um, we have all four and then we did some variations there to get both ECDSA, EDDSA, to get uh, both certificates and uh, 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 and and CVS CWT claim sets. So that's CCS. And also uh, one of the cipher suites is having an error code here. So we have the cipher suite negotiation in in trace number three. Uh, and then some different ways of identifying the credentials with either with with hash or with with chains or with key identifiers or or with uh, C CCS. So that's our our proposal. Um, any uh, anyone care to comment on this now? or else this will end up in the document. And then well, we'd, we'd rather close on the issue first because these are kind of tedious to, to write. Uh, so we probably want to have a decision on this before updating the traces draft. How can we come to a decision in a, 
well, sometime after holidays would be great. I don't think there should be anything in the document that is not shown in at least one trace. Um, sorry, Carson, and that means in practice. That's it. Take out everything from the specification that is not shown in at least one trace. Yeah, this is uh -huh. the traces document. We also have traces in JSON format on GitHub. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do. We do have C509. Yes. Um, th there are there are other ways of identifying credentials. There are X5U. Those are not, I mean, neither of those are in the specification, so to speak. Those are things coming from using COSI, but there's plenty of things coming from using COSI. Yeah. So it's hard to say. And, and all the, I mean, this in, in the sense that these are the four methods that is, that's definitely something in the specification and, and not, not right. That, that, that would speak in favor of those four, I suppose. I understand your philosophy. I just <laughs> hard to apply. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Karsten. I think all of this is already on GitHub. Or not all the cipher suit, but otherwise all everything. But with the DDSA cipher suit is on on GitHub, and many of them are probably generated with ECDSA P two five six. Also, maybe also all of them, but not on the same GitHub. So I see we're running definitely running out of time here. Um, maybe people could comment on the on the list on this. Or um, do we have an issue for this? John, I, have, I can't remember now. I don't think we have an issue, right? But yeah, we have an issue. Sorry, we have an issue about traces, a general issue, but maybe we should bring this up. Maybe it's a separate issue, so it's yeah. easy to find, make it clear. Put, put an action on me to do that. So let's move on to the comments by Sean here. Uh, that would be great if we had time for those. And then there's just ne next steps following. Um, right, so Sean pointed out that Applicability statement, uh, we use the term, uh, but we don't use it in the context of RFC 2026, which was his question. So that's something we might want to change. Uh, I just run through the issues here and people can stop me. Um, and that was, that was a good question about uh, the pr procedure for when to delete the pseudorandom key for X3M. And I just want to, point out that there is this is described in, in the kudos draft, which was referred to previously, but we should have a note about it in this draft as well. And then you, there was a question about when, when to discontinue the, uh, uh, the relationship between error message and discontinue. I think that uh, we mentioned that previously. And another comment was about the, ter the description unspecified for one of the error message and Sean pointed out that maybe that's not exactly right because it's, it is a string. So it's somehow specified. So that, those were one of the few of the comments. Next slide, please. And another one, which I think worth considering is, well, all oh, worth considering. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. That was excellent uh, review and great that we got another pair of eyes to look at these um, at the draft, and uh, but this one was specifically one which I thought about. Do we need this state, a state diagram, or or maybe we don't? Any opinions on that? I'd have to see it first, to be honest. <laughs> so right, which doesn't help. So if it, it you know if it if it makes it easier and, and more clear, great. If it makes it uh, more daunting and scary and uh, Hard to understand, then not so great. So, yeah, I guess my only point was that uh, you know over the years everyone complained bitterly that they that this wasn't there, um, but I, I tend to agree because there there, were, there seemed to be a lot less states here, so I just wasn't sure um, whether it would be worth it. So if it can be done and done cleanly, then great. If if it turns into be a pain, then don't bother. Right. We we'll think about that. 
Okay. Um, yeah, then we have the next steps. We're running out of time rapidly now. Um, yeah, we'd like to complete the reviews, of course, send out emails about things to close, update the traces, and then we need to come to a decision about traces. That was the next steps. And that's it, I think, from, from my side. This is just backup slides. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks, any, any uh, in in the in the zero minutes left? Any comments people have or questions? I guess not. Uh, so, so militia. I guess we, we can send out a poll in the next week or so for a, a mid to late January interim. There's a few actions in the notes. Um, thanks to everybody for presenting and chatting and for taking notes, Marco. Um, and other than, I think that's all we have on that. I hope you all enjoy the holidays wherever you are, assuming it's holiday time for you. And uh, we'll talk to each other on the list, I guess. Anything else, Malisha? Or... Same wishes from me. Everyone have a very Merry Christmas and let's talk again mid January. Okay. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, Malisha, could you hang on for a sec? Bye-bye. Alicia? I, yeah, yes. Let's Could you hang? To zoom. Let's switch to Zoom. Uh, okay, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Okay, I, I, I assume I'm not needed, so I'm going to run away and get dinner. <laughs>